Mortar is usually a simple, lightweight, man-portable, muzzle-loaded weapon consisting of a smooth-bore metal tube fixed to a base plate with a lightweight bipod mount and a sight. They launch explosive shells, technically called bombs, in high-arcing ballistic trajectories. Mortars are typically used as indirect fire weapons for close air support with variety of ammunition. I am absolutely fascinated with mortars due to the fact that this simple weapon can give infantry units superior firepower up against larger forces. Guerrillas and insurgents who at times are mostly equipped with light weapons can get the upper hand on the battlefield with these weapons even when they face enemies who possess heavier weapon systems. Sir, Wilf Sir Wilfred Stokes really was a genius for inventing this new weapon system in World War I. Of course, there have always been mortars used on the battlefield for several hundred years as these weapons found their place as effective siege weapons in medieval Europe and Asia. The most notable use of mortars, well, to me anyways, was when Mehmed the Conqueror utilized large siege mortars when he won the infamous siege of Constantinople in 1453. Another fascinating period, well, to me that is, was during the American Civil War when the Union used massive 13-inch mortars that were either on rail, boat, or in fixed positions to be used against Confederate fortifications. The Siege of Vicksburg comes to mind as General Grant really pummeled the rebels with artillery and mortars in that successful operation. Before that, and since then, mortars have really undergone changes on the battlefield. But the Stokes mortar really was a critical game changer in modern warfare. The weapon proved itself to be extremely useful in the muddy trenches of the Western Front, as mortar as a mortar round could be aimed to fall directly into trenches where artillery shells, because of their low angle of flight, could not possibly go. The Stokes mortar was a simple muzzle-loaded weapon consisting of a smooth bore metal tube fixed to a base plate to absorb recoil with a lightweight bipod mount. When a mortar bomb was dropped into the tube, an impact-sensitive primer in the base of the bomb could make contact with the firing pin at the base of the tube and detonate, firing the bomb towards the target. The Stokes mortar could fire as many as 25 bombs per minute and had a maximum range of 800 yards or 730 meters, firing the original cylindrical unstabilized projectile. A modified version of the mortar, which fired a modern, fin-stabilized, streamlined projectile and had a booster charge for longer range, was developed after World War I. This was, in effect, a new weapon. Ever since then, the Stokes mortar has continued to prove itself valuable to conventional militaries and insurgents throughout the world. The weapon system can be both a direct fire and indir indirect fire weapon, giving the shooter the ability to hide behind cover and lob bombs at the enemy without said enemy to immediately spot them and fire back. Mortars also can have a high rate of fire as they can quickly lob many bombs towards the enemy in a quick succession, suppressing enemy infantry and pounding their fortifications with overwhelming fire. Compared to standard artillery, mortars rate of fire can be quite impressive. Modern militaries throughout the world have developed and adopted many mortar systems of varying size and configurations, but the most widely used are 60mm mortars, 81 and 82mm mortars, and massive 120mm mortars. They are light weapons capable of quick transport, giving troops a high level of mobility over standard artillery. Unlike artillery, they don't require many troops to operate or set up due to their size and simplicity. One or two soldiers can make up a mortar team and use this, these weapons, whereas howitzers and large 
artillery pieces require numerous professional artillery men to operate. I'm going to be repeating myself, but because of high parabolic trajectory with a near vertical descent, the mortar can land bombs on nearby targets, including those behind obstacles or in fortifications, such as light vehicles behind hills or structures, or infantry in trenches or spider holes. Basically, you can get these bombs to land right on the enemy's heads, which can be difficult to accomplish with heavy artillery. Also, mortar bombs can be slightly more powerful than standard artillery shells. For example, a 120mm mortar bomb has approximately the same explosive capability as a 152mm or 155mm artillery shell. There are many types of mortar bombs that can be used like smoke, fragmentation, flares, and even airburst munitions. Mortars are flexible enough to be put onto all types of vehicles that are modified to handle these weapons. Mortar carriers, or mortar trucks, range from Toyota pickup trucks used by insurgents to armored personnel carriers like the M113 or Stryker used by the US military. Mortar carriers give armies and guerrilla forces the ability of sh using shoot and scoot or hit and run tactics. That is, lobbing several bombs towards enemy positions and then quickly departing before the conventional enemy forces can reply with counter battery fire. This can have an immense psychological effect on the enemy, as they can be continually harassed by mortar bombs and not properly locate and react in time to destroy those mortars. Now, while I have listed off the advantages mortars give to insurgents and conventional forces, there are, many se uh, there are several disadvantages with mortars, especially now on the modern battlefield. Because of the fact that most mortars are short-tubed, smooth-bore weapons, this gives the weapon limited range and poor accuracy. That is why it is said that the munitions are being lobbed because, in a sense, they are just being thrown at the enemy. There are rifled mortars, of course, but many of those weapon systems have their own demands as well. Smoothbore mortars can be easily made and don't have the issue of recoil as rifled systems do. Spin stabilized and fin stabilized mortar bombs are somewhat more accurate, but again, not as accurate compared to rifled systems. With a short smooth tube, uh, smooth bore tube, the weapon doesn't have the range of modern howitzers and larger artillery, as, on average, heavy mortars can only reach out to between 9,000 to 13,000 meters. Mortars are anti-personnel weapons, and while they can be effective against infantry, mortars do not make for great anti-armor or anti-tank weapons. Modern tanks, such as the M1 Abrams, could take hits from even 120mm mortars and not be destroyed or significantly damaged. There have been developments into anti-tank munitions for mortars, but these weapons tend to be expensive or are not available to most troops or insurgents. Modern militaries also have very accurate target acquisition and counter-battery radar systems which allow them to figure where the mortars are being fired from and respond with accurate and overwhelming counter-battery fire. In both Iraq and Afghanistan, we saw the effectiveness of these advanced systems as American forces could quickly respond to attacks on their outposts and bases using, uh, usually with 155mm artillery, missile strikes, or airstrikes. Because mortar bombs are lobbed, they fly very slowly towards their targets in comparison to artillery and missiles. Because of this, the American close-in weapon system, Phalanx, has proven itself in protecting base, uh, bases by intercepting bombs in mid-flight before they reach their targets. The Phalanx is practical in that it intercepts the bombs instead of being a counter-battery fire weapon which can cause civilian casualties if the mortars are being fired in urban environments. The Phalanx is one of many advanced defensive weapon systems being developed, 
as the American mis uh, the American military is also moving towards using defensive laser systems as well. Will the mortar be able to s still be useful on the battlefield in the future? Will armed forces move towards relying more on drones as they prove to be more flexible and more practical on the battlefields of the future? Please let me know what you think in the comment section below. Also, I hope there are many uh, there are military veterans who watch this video as I would appreciate their feedback on where I'm wrong or if the information I provided in this video is of any issue. Thank you. Like I said guys, thank you again for watching this video. I know I made a lot of mistakes speaking. It's very hard for me to read a script and to kind of pay attention. I think I have a form of dyslexia and it may, so it's hard for me to do these types of videos. And so if there's any problems in this video, again, put it in the comment section down below and let me know where I'm wrong. But more importantly, I highly recommend you guys watch Maximus's video on mortars as I feel he goes into way more detailed, uh, uh, where he goes into detail and he, where he gives his expert advice on mortars and I feel that video has a lot more information than this video will ever have. But thank you again for watching and please just do me a favor, like and subscribe and watch Maximus's video and check him out. And I hope everybody, uh, hope everybody has a wonderful day. Take care, everybody.